name is um, my name is Maliha Wilson, and I'm a board member of the Churchill Society for the Advancement of Parliamentary Democracy. Um, before I get going, um, I should uh, note that uh, this uh, event is being recorded. And with that, um, I have to say that uh, I'm very delighted to be partnering, and we are delighted to be partnering with the York Minster Park Speakers Series. And this night is only happening because of Alan Williams, and we are truly indebted to you, Alan. Uh, the Church's Society for the Advancement of Parliamentary Democracy is a nonpartisan charitable organization that honors the life of Sir Winston Churchill by facilitating education, discussion, and debate about Canada's parliamentary democracy. Uh, more tangibly, we try to make for more educated and politically literate citizens, more engaged electorate, and less cynicism for political institutions and better, more relevant and civil public policy debate. Recently, we hosted Catherine Grace Katz, who wrote a fascinating account of the relationship among three young women who were chosen by their fathers to travel with them to the Yorta Conference, Kathleen Harriman, Sarah Churchill, and Anna Roosevelt. Tonight, I hope to hear about the special friendship between the leaders of England and Canada who worked together to win the war over the Nazis. Again, on uh, behalf of our society, thank you for allowing us to participate tonight. And I will turn it over to Alan to introduce Professor Neville Thompson. Alan. Thank you, Malaha. And I also want to thank David Piper, who is organizing the, uh, the Zoom webinar and uh, making sure that things run smoothly on the technical side. So thank you, David. I also extend a warm welcome to all who are joining us by Zoom for tonight's lecture, hosted by the Churchill Society for the Advancement of Parliamentary Democracy and co-sponsored by the York Minster Park Speaker Series. The Churchill Society, as Malaha said, is a nonpartisan charitable organization that honors the life of Sir Winston Churchill by facilitating education, discussion, and debate about Canada's parliamentary democracy. Our website is churchillsociety.org, where you can read about upcoming activities, including the 38th annual Churchill Society Award Dinner, which honors an outstanding individual for his or her record of service to the cause of Canadian parliamentary democracy. At this year's event on November 30th, which is Churchill's birthday, the honoree is former Prime Minister Brian Mulroney. For more information about past honorees, about this year's dinner, and to buy a ticket, visit churchillsociety.org. Co-sponsoring tonight's lecture is the York Minster Park Speaker Series, which offers continuing education lectures by outstanding speakers on topics of general interest. These lectures are on Friday evenings about once a month from September through to June. The website is ypspeakerseries.com, where you can read about upcoming lectures. You can sign up to receive an email notice about a week or 10 days prior to each lecture. And you can also watch our 12 most recent lectures. Tonight's presentation will be available through either group's website in a day or two. The next two lectures in the York Minister Park Speaker Series are on Friday, October 15th, writer, hiker, and trail guide author Nicola Ross will speak on hiking where your heart is. And on Friday, November 5th, historian Tim Cook from Canada's National War Museum will speak on forgetting, remembering, and remaking Canada's Second World War. Both these lectures will be webcasts and you can register at ypspeakerseries.com. Tonight's lecture by Professor Thompson is via Zoom, and there will be time for question and answer afterwards. You're invited to ask questions as they occur to you during the lecture using the Q&A function, which is found at the bottom of your screen or on some systems, it may be at the top of your screen in the Zoom menu 
other audience members will not be able to see your question. Just Professor Thompson and myself. We will have about 20 minutes at the end and we will try to get to as many of your questions as we can. And now on to our guest speaker. Neville Thompson earned his BA in history from McMaster University in 1962 and his master's and doctorate from Princeton. He taught at Turin College and McMaster University for five years before moving back to the University of Western Ontario in 1973, where he taught history as an associate professor and then professor until 2004, when he was named Emeritus Professor. I had the privilege of hearing Professor Thompson's lectures many years ago as a first year student at Western in History 20, Introduction to European History. In addition to teaching, Neville Thompson has served on the board of the Ontario Heritage Foundation and of the Historica Foundation, and was on the advisory, the editorial advisory board of the International History Review. Relevant to the advancement of parliamentary democracy, Neville served as a member of both the Canadian Federal and Ontario Provincial Electoral Boundaries Commissions. He's written five books on British and Canadian history, Wellington After Waterloo, Earl Bathurst and the British Empire, and Canada and the End of the Imperial Dream. And on the subject of tonight's lecture, two books written 50 years apart. In 1971, Neville published The Anti-Appeasers, Conservative Opposition to Appeasement in the 1930s. Winston Churchill was, of course, the most prominent and important of the anti-appeasers. And 50 years later, earlier this year in 2021, Neville has just published The Third Man, Churchill, Roosevelt, Mackenzie King, and the Untold Friendships that Won World War II. There are, of course, hundreds of books about Churchill, and one could ask, is there anything new to say? What makes this book unique and so interesting to read is the use it makes of the remarkable diary of William Lyon Mackenzie King which, as Neville says in the introduction, runs to 30,000 pages, 30,000 typewritten pages, and some 7.5 million words. Quoting from the introduction, Mackenzie's, Mackenzie King's diary has been widely used for Canadian domestic politics and also for imperial and foreign policy, but it has not previously been extensively employed to illuminate both Churchill and Roosevelt, their interactions with each other, and also with King. Several books, he says, might be said to be preliminary assemblies for a narrative and analysis, which this book seeks to provide. It is a fascinating book, and I encourage you to buy it and to read it. It was published by Sutherland House, and as a benefit of joining this lecture tonight, you can get a 20% discount if you buy your copy through Sutherland House website, which is sutherlandhousebooks.com. Um, and the, the, the detailed URL is on the screen, but you can find it by going to sutherlandhousebooks.com and using the code thirdman20. And you, of course, can also buy a copy at any major bookstore. Tonight's lecture will draw on both these books, The Anti-Appeasers and The Third Man, and on the more than 50 years of distinguished scholarship they represent. We are honored to have Professor Neville Thompson with us tonight. Neville, welcome, and the floor is yours. Thank you much, very much, Alan, for that uh, kind introduction and your happy memories of being a student. I'm glad that someone was happy with my lectures. Uh, as Alan said, and I should have remembered myself more accurately if my mind were a bit sharper at this late stage, it's exactly 50 years since I published the Anti-Appeasers. Uh, which meant that uh, in order to write a book about the critics of appeasement, of course, you have to understand appeasement itself. So Alan suggested a few months ago uh, that I uh, talk to you about appeasement, which is a, a subject of particular interest, of course, to the Churchill Society, since Winston Churchill was certainly the most prominent critic of appeasement in the 1930s. But since I had just a few months ago, uh, earlier this year, also published a book on uh, McKin 
Winston Churchill, Franklin Roosevelt, and Mackenzie King, uh, I thought perhaps we should extend the uh, topic a little bit and talk about appeasement with particular reference uh, to Churchill and to Mackenzie King it's himself. Uh, it not only brings in uh, two books 50 years apart, but it also brings in a Canadian perspective. And one of my aims in writing uh, The Third Man was to try to put Canada on the world stage. I mean, there are many books about Canada in the Second World War, uh, but most of them written by Canadians uh, for a Canadian audience within a Canadian framework. And what is necessary is to put Canada into the wider picture uh, where it uh, very rarely appears. Uh, so tonight I'm bringing Mackenzie King in then. This is a minor actor, it can only be that, uh, in this, this, this discussion of uh, appeasement. I began my career uh, working on appeasement, writing my first book. Then I wandered off into the early 19th century uh, and wrote books uh, on topics uh, there. Uh, and in the last two books, last 10 years or more, 20 years, I suppose, I've come back uh, more, more or less the 20th century and both topics involve appeasement. But even during the uh, sort of interval, I never lost touch with the topic of appeasement, uh, partly because uh, I knew something about it. I wanted to keep up my interest in it. And also because the subject continues to be one of enormous interest not just to me, but to many other people. When I wrote The anti appeasers in 1971, I really thought that that would be one of the last books on the subject. There have been a huge amount of discussion on appeasement in the 1960s, uh, partly because many uh, papers became available, private papers and also government papers. In 1967, the British government and the Canadian government followed suit on this, uh, reduced the uh, restriction on government documents from 50 years to 30. And that meant that in 1967, the documents were available for 1937, the next year, 1938, and so on. This legislation was introduced by Prime Minister Harold Wilson, Labour Prime Minister of uh, Britain at the time, not so much for the benefit of historians, but rather because he wanted to embarrass his conservative opponents uh, by dragging up uh, the foreign policy of the 1930s. And he certainly succeeded. There were a lot of books came out in the late uh, 1960s. I thought mine uh, would be the uh, among the last, uh, but it was not. Part of the reason uh, that there have been so many books since in the past 50 years on the subject of appeasement is because new material continues to be available. Private papers, but also government papers. This was particularly true in the 1990s after the Cold War, when the Russian government, uh, temporarily at least, opened many of its papers on the 20th century. Uh, I now believe that they're closed. I don't read Russian or, or know anything about those papers, uh, but for a short time, they were open uh, and contained some very interesting stuff, which again prompted a lot of books on that particular uh, subject. Uh, so new material is one reason. Another reason is perspective. As time moves on, uh, the way in which we look at the 1930s or any period for that matter is very different. History is always, a kind of dialogue between the present and the past, explaining the past uh, to the present, which has its own concerns, and its own concerns, of course, are necessarily reflected in the way in which historians write research and write their topics. Uh, such a magisterial work as Edward Gibbons, a massive history of the decline and fall of the Roman Empire, for example, was not just about a thousand years or more of the uh, way in which the Roman Empire disappeared. It was also a warning to British aristocrats in the late uh, 18th century that if they didn't take their job seriously, Britain and its empire would uh, face the same kind of fate. So even a book like that then uh, was written with some present concerns in mind. And this is certainly always true of books about appeasement. Appeasement, meaning British policy 
towards Germany in the 19th century is also a moral issue and will be for a long time to come. Uh, in any discussion of how diplomacy can be, can, should be conducted, what is wrong and what is right, within a very short period, will bring in appeasement and the story of the 1930s. And the shorthand uh, term appeasement has become synonymous uh, with uh, a foreign policy of weakness, cowardice, and caving in to the threat of force. So as a moral issue then, the conduct of British foreign policy in the 1930s continues to be a present concern and will continue to be so. In, for example, the West's relations with China or Russia or whatever it happens to be. The 1930s will always be invoked. And this is one of the reasons why it remains, uh, after all these years, uh, still an important consideration. So tonight's topic then, at Alan's suggestion, uh, and a good one, was appeasement. What does it mean? In the original sense, and just in the abstract, appeasement means conciliation or soothing. And even in diplomacy, at any time, in any place, this is a lot of what it is all about. Diplomacy is not about making wars, it's about trying to avoid wars by one means or another. And one very powerful means always is conciliation or appeasement. Well, the term now is not used. Nobody dares use the term appeasement to describe a good foreign policy. So this is the original meaning then. And the term was very appealing after uh, the catastrophe of the First World War. Appeasement was a way of distinguishing a foreign policy which was not a rush to war, which had characterized so many countries in 1914. I mean, at the beginning of July 1914, very few people thought, or the tension crises, very few people thought uh, that Europe was on the edge of a war. Just over a month later, many countries were involved in it. It was a kind of rush to war. So appeasement then was going to be a different way of doing it, carefully considering uh, uh, problems, trying to solve them by discussion, by conference, by reason, by goodwill on both sides. In a sense, it was going back to the diplomacy of the 19th century of Castlereagh and Metternich at the end of the Napoleonic Wars of Bismarck in the late 19th century. But nobody wanted to invoke those people too much because they were too reminiscent of an age of monarchy and aristocracy. The world after the First World War was supposedly a more democratic world in which foreign policy will be discussed and decided in a democratic way, in the same way as tax policy and so on, not by monarchs and a small elite acting in secrecy. It would be an open uh, diplomacy. So this was what appeasement then meant at the time, trying uh, a policy which would try to avoid war. And after the First World War, there were not many people uh, who could face with equanimity the prospect of another war, which had been so devastating in deaths and destruction and in huge debts, which dominated the economic discussions of the interwar years. But another reason why people were so wary of war was that the First World War had not lived up to its promises. It was quickly clear in the early 1920s that it had not, in fact, been a war to win wars. There were lots of small wars going on in Russia and uh, elsewhere. It had also not been a war to make the world safe for democracy. 
uh, in many countries in the 1920s and in the 1930s, uh, autocratic governments uh, came into power. So the number of democracies in the world was very small by 1939. Nobody wanted another war. Moreover, by the 1930s, the world was plunged into a huge economic crisis, which whether correctly or not was linked to the First World War because the two things had happened in such close uh, conjunction. Uh, so the first, uh, avoiding war then meant really avoiding disaster. Many people in the British elite in particular who thought in sort of big terms, thought that another great war would destroy Britain, would destroy the empire, it would destroy the structure of society in which the aristocrats and the wealthy were at the top, and it would destroy Britain's position as a world power. Britain emerged from the First World War uh, in principle greater than it went in with a, a much bigger empire. But most of the people who follow these things realize that in fact, it was weaker than it had been before 1914. So avoiding war then meant preserving the existing order. In Canada, which of course participated in the First World War from the very beginning to the end, many people thought that Europe's problems were none of Canada's business. Europe should sort these things out itself and not depend on Canada trying uh, to bail it out of uh, difficulties. Another war for Canada might also tear apart a large, diverse and fragile country, culturally diverse in the way in which conscription during the war, 1917-18, and a variety of uh, discontents after the war that threatened to do. It was a near miss, many people thought, but Canada hadn't fallen apart in and after the First World War. Another war would make the situation even worse. Keep things calm, preserve the peace. This was the watchword in Canada. Canada itself, in the 1920s and in the 1930s did not have a distinct foreign policy, even though by the statute of Westminster of 1931, the dominions were in effect independent countries could follow their own course. Canada had a tiny uh, sort of diplomatic service, only relations with a very few countries. Uh, the Minister of External Affairs, Foreign Affairs, was also uh, the Prime uh, Minister. What it did in effect was to follow British policy, trying to influence it a bit, uh, but just basically leaving the responsibility to Britain. And Canada was not alone in this among the dominions. The same was true of New Zealand, Australia, and to some extent, South Africa, which is a complex business because South Africa was divided between uh, British settlers and Dutch settlers who had a very different uh, view of the world and of the British connection. The dominion that was an exception to what I've just said was Ireland, which technically became a dominion in 1922 as a Southern Ireland, uh, but in fact, uh, conducted itself as an independent country, particularly after 1938, and refused to have anything to do with British foreign policy. Indeed, it remained neutral throughout the Second uh, World uh, War, refusing uh, to side with Britain. Mackenzie King was Prime Minister in the 1920s, and then again after 1935, after the interlude of R.B. Bennett from 1930 to 1935. Mackenzie King in the late 1930s, pinned his faith on a sensible foreign policy on Neville Chamberlain, who became prime minister in 1937. Neville Chamberlain was a former businessman, uh, an experienced uh, government minister, particularly as uh, chancellor of the exchequer, but also as minister of health, of whom King and many other people thought would find a reasonable 
solution to Germany's grievances, which Germany claimed stemmed from the peace settlement of 1919, which had been imposed on it. And Mackenzie King, as I say, was not the only one who uh, sort of reposed his faith specifically on Neville Chamberlain and the policy that we now describe as appeasement. The same thing was true of Robert Menzies, the prime minister of Australia, who was usually regarded as a very great imperialist. The same was true of Jan Smuts of South Africa, who was not prime minister of that country in the late 1930s, but had been before and became so again when the Second World War began in 1939. In Canada, Mackenzie King was by no means alone. Most people in Canada uh, sort of agreed with him, leave it to Britain. Britain will manage to solve this problem. There was no difference between the liberals and the conservative opposition, uh, which liked to think of itself uh, as a much more uh, uh, sort of forceful uh, group uh, than the Liberals. And here, for example, is a statement uh, by George Drew, uh, Colonel Drew, as he liked to be called, a veteran of the uh, First World War, uh, who became uh, Premier of Ontario in 1948, leader of the federal opposition, and uh, became sorry, Premier of Ontario in 1943, leader of the federal opposition in 1948. Uh, during the war was a fierce critic of Mackenzie King's military policies. In 1938, after Austria had been absorbed into Germany, this is what George Drew uh, wrote in Maclean's uh, magazine. Uh, he said that Nazism stood for racial pride, not for hatred of others, he claimed that the spirit of friendship would curb the extremes of Nazism. He recognized that Nazi methods were a bit rush, rough. Germans, he said, did not hate the British, and it was not helpful to have them think that the British hated them. Drew had been to Germany, talked to Germans in many parts of the country, and was convinced they would rather have the friendship of Britain than any other country. There was, he said, no conflict of interest between Germany and the British Empire, which included Canada. They could get along, trade uh, the goods that they had one for another and be friends. So this is George Drew then, a uh, kind of strong imperialist militarist in 1938. He did not want another war. There was practically unanimity among the Canadian elite in the 1930s about this as there was in Britain. Appeasement, the foreign British foreign policy in the 1930s is often presented as a duel between Hitler and the British government, specifically Neville Chamberlain, with France tagging along with Britain out of fear that if it differed from Britain, it would find itself abandoned in any crisis or conflict. But in fact, the situation is far more complex than that. And that is what makes it such a difficult issue to deal with it. There's a tremendous complexity to it. It wasn't just Britain versus Germany. There were many threats uh, to, to Western democracies in the 1930s. And it was not clear which one was the greatest, but it was clear that even the greatest combination could not fight all of them. It was necessary to conciliate some in order to confront others. Which was it going to be? In retrospect, of course, it's perfectly clear that it was Germany that was a threat and which should have been opposed strongly. But that was not how it seemed at the time. To many people, the Soviet Union seemed a far greater threat to peace, stability, freedom, and democracy than Germany. The Soviet government was officially 
committed to revolution, to overthrowing the capitalist order, which means liberal democracy all over the world. Which was the greater threat, Germany or the Soviet Union? For most people, it seemed it was the Soviet Union, which worked, of course, very much to Hitler's advantage. But there was more to it even than that. In the Far East, Germany was expanding into China and was potentially a threat to British and other European colonies in Southeast Asia, as well as the US possessions in the Pacific. How much of a threat was Japan? Were its aims limited or not? We know the answer now, but nobody in the 1930s did. Another country, which seems relatively minor compared to these, was Italy. Mussolini, who became the Italian dictator in 1922, uh, and was much admired by many people, including Winston Churchill, for bringing order uh, to Italy, was clamoring uh, for uh, colonies to extend its colonies in Africa. Just as other countries did, they wanted their place in the uh, sun. Italy now, after the Second World War, does not appear to have been any major threat. But at the time, it was thought that Italy had a great army. Whenever visitors went to Italy, they reviewed massive numbers of troops, went to the next town, and, uh, inspected other great numbers of troops, uh, third town and so on. What they didn't know was that these troops were being rushed overnight from one town to the other, and they were reviewing the same ones. Mussolini was also supposed to have a great navy and a great air force, which is so skilled uh, that it could drop bombs down the smokestacks of ships and blow them up. This, of course, was sheer fantasy, uh, but Mussolini claimed this, and nobody was particularly keen to put this uh, to the test. So the, the situation then was not just Germany, it was all these other countries as well, most particularly the Soviet Union, but also uh, Japan and Italy in that order. And all this, of course, at a time of great economic and social dislocation all over the world, much poverty and much preoccupation with domestic affairs. What many leaders of government, of course, wanted to do was to forget about the world if they could and to try to concentrate on rebuilding their countries in science. The person who stands out as the most conspicuous opponent of appeasement, of uh, ignoring the world, of playing along, or conciliating and so on, is Winston Churchill. This is a large, his opposition to appeasement is a large part of the reason that he became the leader of his country and the savior of it in 1940. His reputation will always be based on opposition to appeasement and saving his country in the Second World War, and these two things are linked. It was the warnings which made him seem like an ideal leader to the left, to the Labour Party, as well as to the right in 1940. But it, the picture of, that he presents of appeasement and his role in it, particularly in The Gathering Storm, the first uh, volume of his uh, uh, six volumes on the Second World War, is not quite as simple as he presents. And even he, though he didn't play this up in his memoirs or anywhere else, did not think that every aggression could be opposed. Governments would have to make some choices. In 1941, he said to Mackenzie King uh, that although he wished that he'd been in government, he realized it would not have been possible for him uh, to uh, have all his own policies in the late 1930s. What he hoped he would have been able to do would have been 
uh, to influence the government strongly in the right direction. There's a kind of irony here, though, as well. But if he'd been in the government, then he might have been discredited like everybody else and might never have become prime minister at a crucial moment in 1940. Well, that raises the question, of course, of why wasn't Churchill in government? A fairly popular story is that he was too uh, strong a person. But Stanley Baldwin and Neville Chamberlain simply didn't want him in uh, the government as well as because he would be too demanding, uh, as well as disagreeing with his policies. And yet, Churchill had been in Baldwin's government from 1924 to 1929 as Chancellor of the Exchequer, and he got along very well with Neville Chamberlain. Even in the late 1930s, uh, the uh, government put him on a secret committee which was concerned with rearmament, despite the fact that at the same time he was criticizing them for not rearming fast enough. So they were, they were colluding with him in a way. The reason that Churchill was not in the government in the early 1930s was because from 1931 to 1935, he was bitterly opposing any extension of self-government to India. He had about 80 followers. Uh, the chances of him winning were practically zero, but he fought tooth and nail, gave far more speeches against Indian self-government than he ever did against uh, Nazi uh, Germany. He worked to uh, break, uh, to, to uh, seize the leadership of the Conservative Party from Stanley Baldwin, get rid of the coalition national government, and to bring into power a real Conservative government which would resist any demand for self-government from India. He even supported candidates uh, against the government of which he was a nominal uh, supporter. So it's not surprising that, uh, that he was excluded from government at that uh, time. After the Government of India Act passed in the summer of 1935, his government, his uh, repu Churchill's reputation, uh, began uh, to revise. And in 1936, uh, he embarked on a great campaign for arms and the government, covenant, by which he meant that Britain and other countries too should rearm, uh, they should mobilize, uh, the idealism of the League of Nations. The covenant referred to as the covenant of the League of Nations, uh, sort of opposing aggression and standing for freedom and democracy. And he got considerable support, particularly from uh, left-wing people, including trade unionists, in 1936. So he was building then a kind of collective movement uh, for a, a, a sort of more robust foreign uh, policy. And this seemed to be going fairly well until in December 1936, the whole thing crashed down when Churchill gave his support uh, to, the, uh, to Edward VII, who was forced to abdicate because he wanted to marry a twice divorced American woman. All his allies left him. He was shouted down in the House of uh, Commons. Uh, support was on the side of the government, which said uh, that Edward VIII uh, could not continue uh, with uh, such a wife, and he resigned. So, in, so these are the reasons then, up to 1936, that Churchill was not in uh, government uh, for a variety of uh, reasons. By 1938, uh, when the foreign policy really became a crisis, Churchill was regarded as so bellicose that including him in a government would be a signal that Britain was no longer interested in trying to avoid war, but in fact was going to adopt a policy of uh, fighting. The change came in 1939, when uh, Churchill's uh, reputation soared, when the prophecies that he had made became true after Germany's seizure of Prague in March of that uh, year. But even then, he was kept out of the government because uh, the ministry was hoping that they would be able to avoid war, not now by conciliation, but by confronting Germany with armed force, which depended 
on an, on, on an agreement with the Soviet Union, which was a true revolution. They were willing to accept a communist government to oppose Nazi Germany, which was worse. So this is why Churchill was not in the government. It's also why he was quickly taken into the government the minute the war was declared. Well, the second issue is could the Second World War have been so easily present, prevented as Churchill claimed, notably in the gathering storm, but on many other occasions uh, as well. If it could be prevented, when could it be prevented and how? For Churchill, the answer always was Germany's occupation of the Rhineland in 1936, when Hitler moved in to the German buffer zone between Germany uh, and uh, France uh, and seized it without any notice whatsoever. This was the moment, said Churchill, when the Second World War could have been uh, prevented. But there was more to it uh, than that. The aggression, as I suggested before, goes back even further. Japan's seizure of Manchuria in 1931, and then obviously, which was a province of China, and then obviously its ambitions on China itself. If Japan had been stopped, it's argued, the precedent would have been there to end aggression. Where did Churchill stand on this? He was very sympathetic to Japan. He thought it was bringing order to China, keeping it free of communism. And he claimed that China was what India would be if the British force were ever withdrawn. So perhaps the Second World War then began, or the road to Second World War began in 1931. Another point, of course, was Hitler coming to power in Germany in 1933. Not that there's anything wrong with that, but his immediate program of beginning rearmament. But who was willing to march into Germany to demand that Germany disarm, particularly when the, those who'd made the peace in 1919 had not fulfilled their promise of disarming themselves. Moreover, as Hitler remained in power very soon, uh, he uh, sort of rebuilt his own country by ignoring conventional economics, revived the economy. Uh, many admired his achievement uh, in producing a healthy, highly employed, virile people uh, who were not decadent at all, and who would stand as a bulwark against the expansion of communism from the Soviet Union into the rest of uh, Europe. So Germany then, under Hitler at first, was ambivalent. And in 1934, Winston Churchill wrote an essay about Hitler in which he said, things could turn out well or they could not. Nobody knows how it's going to happen. The threat uh, to peace and order came first, not from Germany at all, uh, but from Italy, which attacked uh, Ethiopia, which was then known uh, as uh, Abyssinia. Should the uh, countries, democratic countries, have stopped it there? There's a lot of sympathy, admiration, uh, with Italy, including uh, from Winston Churchill. If it wanted to have an extra colony in a backward part of Europe, it was a slave-holding country, bringing civilization to that part of the world, perhaps it wasn't such a bad thing. So Italy was allowed to get away with it, to sum this up uh, very briefly. In Canada, there was no chance, no chance at all, uh, that the country would fight for Ethiopia. It might fight for Britain, but it would not fight for Ethiopia and would not oppose Italy on this at all. It was while attention was 
preoccupied with the, with the Italian attack on Ethiopia that in March 1936, Hitler invaded the Rhineland and took it over. As I say, this the German speaking uh, buffer which had been created in 1919 between Germany and uh, France. Everybody knew that it was German by the principle of self-determination, uh, which had been laid down in 1919, which meant essentially the people of the same languages should be allowed to live together. Uh, this was Hitler's justification. Many people thought and said that Hitler was simply walking into his own backyard. His methods may have been a bit rough, but there was nothing particularly wrong with it. Churchill at the time said nothing about it. He was silent because he was hoping for a job in the government. When he didn't get it, three weeks later, he uh, had plenty to say about the event. And he insisted that opposing the, 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 what, he, what he said uh, three weeks later was that this removal of the buffer between France and Germany uh, sort of exposed the country, uh, the, the, the uh, continent to the risk of war, uh, especially since Germany was rearming. So he warned then against uh, the consequence of this. But it's interesting to notice that at the time, he did not suggest that Germany be expelled, uh, expelled uh, from the Rhineland. There were many people, Hitler, or Churchill was silent on this, who thought that removing Germany from the Rhineland would lead to the fall of the Nazi government and its replacement by a communist one, which might even be much worse. Churchill's argument that essentially was one of balance of power, not about the nature of the German government, but that Germany was becoming uh, too strong and it was a threat to the peace of Europe in the same way that Louis XIV had been at the beginning of the 18th century, a subject on which Churchill in the 1930s spent a huge amount of attention writing about the massive biography of his ancestor, the Duke of Marlborough, uh, who fought uh, those wars against uh, France. 1930s, the 1930s is generally seen as a, de de a whole decade of diplomatic crises, as well as economic depression. But in fact, in 1937, all the way from Hitler's occupation of the Rhineland until the spring of 1938, uh, two years later, in fact, things seem to be settling down. About the only uh, sort of major diplomatic uh, event which seemed minor at the time was a, a civil war which broke out in Spain in July, 1936. Nobody paid much attention to this. This was just one of a long series of civil wars which had been fought in that country ever since the Napoleonic Wars at the beginning of the 19th century. But as the civil war went on, uh, two ideological sides got involved, Germany and Japan supporting Franco and the insurgents, the fascists, uh, the Soviet government supporting uh, the, uh, the, the, the Spanish government. So people were taking sides for and against communism versus fascism as the civil war went on. Winston Churchill started out sympathetic to Franco and to the authoritarian government, which would be imposed on the disorder of Spain. By 1939, he'd come around the other way and seen uh, Franco, uh, a friend, uh, perhaps ally of Hitler and Mussolini as a, a danger. But this was somewhat in the future. In 1938, events really, crises really came to a head. First of all, with the German seizure of Austria, which was Hitler's native country, German speaking country, with many Germans wanting, well, many, sorry, many Austrians wanting to join Germany, which is a much more prosperous uh, country than Austria, which was sunk in depression. But Hitler had done this again, like seizing the Rhineland without any notice, whatsoever, 
uh, without any discussion with any other country, uh, without any orderly occupation whatsoever. And this, of course, was denounced strongly by uh, Churchill uh, as upsetting the balance of power even more. Now Germany was reaching far into Central Europe. It was obvious that the next target was going to be the German-speaking people of Czechoslovakia, a multicultural, multilingual democracy in the center of Europe, which had a German fringe around the edge, which abutted Austria, which is now part of uh, Germany. This was obviously the next uh, target uh, for attack. Czechoslovakia was a democracy. It was a country which was well armed. It was also a country which produced a massive amount of arms. But it was also a fragile multicultural country. And it was not clear that the Germans in the country and the Slovaks at the other end would even fight for Czechoslovakia. Neville Chamberlain, with the French Prime Minister following along on Mussolini supporting Hitler, negotiated, as he saw it, the orderly surrender of the German speaking part, with Hitler guaranteeing that he would respect the independence of the rest. This Munich is always regarded as the kind of great, well, whatever, the, 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 it, it, it's, it's a synonym for appeasement, simply caving in. This was not appeasement in the way of which it had been presented in principle earlier. There was no real conference. Czechoslovakia was not included in the discussions. It was simply told the result. Everything was hasty. The occupation was immediate. Czechoslovakia was not allowed uh, to remove its armaments, but it was obvious that what was left of Czechoslovakia would be vulnerable uh, to a further attack. Neville Chamberlain, in high hope, trusted Hitler's promises of peace and that he had no further demands. This seems incredibly naive now, but at the time, there was tremendous uh, relief and enthusiasm for it in Britain, in France, and in Canada. The military historian Charles Stacey, who was a severe critic of Mackenzie King, said uh, that when the uh, Munich crisis was on, he had never seen so much fear on the faces of people in the streets of Toronto at that time. And there was huge rejoicing in Canada and elsewhere that war had been averted. Winston Churchill, in a sense, made his uh, subsequent uh, reputation by giving one of the greatest speeches of his life, in which he said that Munich was a defeat for Britain and France. It was not a victory at all. Germany was now dominant in Europe. It had massive amounts of arms, including those of Czechoslovakia. At the time, he was much criticized uh, and dismissed as a bellicose person who was eager for war. But as the winter of 1938-39 wore on, there was more sympathy for Churchill because his warnings seemed to be coming true. In, 19, in November 1938, the Germans launched a massive pogrom against the Jews, humiliating them, beating them up, smashing their shops, and so on. What kind of regime was this that the British and French had made a deal with? In March 1939, Hitler marched into Prague and seized uh, the Czech part of Czechoslovakia. The Slovaks then became nominally independent, in fact, a kind of client state of Germany. This was the first time that Hitler had uh, uh, demanded non 
German speaking parts of Europe. He had violated his own principles and his appeal to the principles that had ended the First World War in 1939. Suddenly, appeasement seemed to end. Churchill had been right all along. The British government almost overnight determined to stand up uh, to Hitler and to prohibit any further expansion. How, uh, Poland was the obvious target, how was it going to do this? The only way it could do it was to uh, form some kind of agreement with the Soviet Union. This meant swallowing fear and dislike of communism and ex embracing a communist state uh, as a partner in stopping Hitler. Churchill himself, a strong anti-communist, had already decided in 1938 that bad as the Soviet Union was, Germany was worse, and that some attempt should be made to get the Soviet Union on the side of the Western democratic uh, allies. It was also thought that uh, resisting Hitler was in Soviet interest since Hitler obviously had ambitions on the oil and grain of, uh, of Russia. So the government then was sure uh, that there was going to be an agreement. And Churchill was kept out of the government because it was thought that his presence within the government would symbolize that they uh, were really going to war and not trying to find a peaceful way to stop it by some agreement with the Soviet Union. These hopes, the confidence of Chamberlain and others that it would work out, including Mackenzie King, uh, that it would work out, collapsed on the 22nd of August, 1938, when Hitler made a deal with Stalin. Nazism made a deal with communism to which it was in principle ideologically opposed. It was used to be thought that the reason that the British and the French failed in their negotiations with the Soviet Union was because uh, they were too hesitant, too slow, uh, too unwilling to make a real deal. In the 1990s, when temporarily uh, Russian archives were open, uh, it was revealed that in fact, uh, the reason that the negotiations failed was because Britain and France would not hand over to the Soviet Union, uh, the former parts of the Russian Empire, Eastern Europe, uh, as the price of a Russian agreement. In other words, they would not hand over to the Soviet Union what they were forbidding to Hitler. They could do no other. But Hitler was willing to hand over Eastern Europe to the Soviets in order to get a non-aggression uh, pact that the two would be friends. And it was now clear that Hitler was safe to attack in Europe without any prospect of being opposed by the massive Soviet Union. So this was how the Second World War began. On the, third of, on the 1st of September on Germany's part, on the 3rd of September on Britain's part. Appeasement had clearly failed. Nobody dared to use the term again. But perhaps it had never really been tried in the uh, sort of uh, way in which it had been described after the First World War. But even in its failure, Appeasement had achieved something paradoxically. No one could say that Britain and France had not tried everything to avoid war. Appeasement had exposed Hitler's duplicity. He was clearly responsible. Britain's motives may have been wrong, but they were not ignoble. There was no rushing to war. Everything had been tried. And for that reason, Britain and Canada too went to war in a relatively 
united way, which they might not have done, probably wouldn't have done, 1938 and 1936. Winston Churchill uh, said at the very beginning of the war, just before he was taken into the government, the day before, he said, in this solemn hour, it is a consolation to recall and to dwell upon our repeated efforts for peace. They were not his efforts, they were the government's efforts. All have been ill starred, but all have been faithful and sincere. This moral conviction alone affords that ever fresh resilience, which renews the strength and energy of people in long, doubtful and dark days, which obviously lay ahead. Our hands may be active, but our consciences are at rest. So the term appeasement then was discredited as it's attached, as it's used to describe British foreign policy in the 1930s. And it always invoked as the way not to do diplomacy. But the practices, the practice and the principle of trying to avoid war by making some accommodation between continues, between countries always continues. How much to trust, how much to rely on promises, how much to threaten, and in what form, even among allies and friends, as well as opponents, is the challenge of democracy, the challenge of diplomacy. I give the last word on the subject to Winston Churchill, who, more than anyone else, had sterling credentials to pronounce on appeasement. After the war, even though his Iron Curtain speech of March 1946 in many ways announced the Cold War, his great aim in the last decade of his public life, which ended in 1955, was to lead the Western world into some agreement with the Soviet Union in order to avoid nuclear war, which would be far more terrible than the First and Second World Wars. And in the hope of such agreement, he told Parliament at the end of 1950, a year before he became Prime Minister for the second time, he said, appeasement in itself may be good or bad according to the circumstances. Appeasement from weakness and fear is alike futile and fatal. Appeasement from strength is magnanimous and noble and might be the surest and perhaps the only path to world peace. A conference between the left Western and Soviet leaders never happened. The American presidents, Harry Truman and Dwight Eisenhower, much as they liked and admired Churchill, feared that they would be lured into some false agreement like Churchill at Munich. The legacy of what was called appeasement in the 1930s lingered on and lingers still. But so do the hope and the principles that Churchill recognized and expressed in 1950. Professor Thompson, thank you so much for that lecture. As you said before we uh, began, you could talk about this for uh, hours, and uh, I think I could listen to this for hours as well. Um, but we do uh, want to uh, wrap up by about eight twenty. So um, thank you for for uh, bringing it uh, bringing the talk to a close at eight. And we do have some questions that have come in. Uh, I would um, just mention, um, you know, it, it, for the clarity of of thought and presentation of the of the lecture. I just again recommend um, uh, The Third Man as uh, a book that um, anybody interested in this topic should, should uh, buy and read. Um, we have several questions that have come in. And again, I would also suggest though that if you have a question that uh, you want to hear more about, you can enter it in the Q&A uh, function at the bottom of the screen and we will try to get to it. We do have about 15 or 20 minutes. So um, first thing, um, uh, Neville, is um, with respect to uh, Mackenzie King, could you could you talk a little bit about the relationship between Mackenzie King and, and Churchill? One of the remarkable things uh, in the book is you, you catalog how they've known each other since 1900, 
Um, and I get the sense that King admired him, but was a little bit, thought he was a little bit dangerous. And maybe you could discuss uh, how in the 30s um, he came around to the side of, um, of supporting uh, Churchill's uh, war efforts. Well, thank you, Al. Uh, as, you, as you see, I mean, I've written a whole book on the uh, subject, not just about Churchill and, uh, and, uh, and King, but also uh, Roosevelt uh, as well. But uh, as you just uh, indicated, uh, Churchill and King had a very long relationship. They met uh, first in 1900. They were exactly the same age, just two, uh, two weeks different in age. They met in 1900. They became very well acquainted from 1906 on when King was a young civil servant going to uh, London uh, to seek the aid of the imperial government on the matter of immigration. Uh, so Winston Churchill said somewhere in the early 1940s that they'd uh, been friends so long that it must have seemed as though they'd been children uh, together. But this doesn't mean that they always agreed. There were, there were strong disagreements, uh, particularly on two things. One was the empire. Uh, Winston Churchill believed in a strong unified empire acting together as one force in the world. And he had a lot of sympathy with that in Canada. Mackenzie King's view of the uh, empire, at least the self-governing part, the Commonwealth, which prevailed over Churchill, was that these were independent countries voluntarily agreeing uh, to uh, act together uh, uh, to defend each other on the principle uh, that they were uh, descended from the same political culture, the same legal system, and the same even literary culture. But they could make their decisions on this. So that when Ireland in 1939 did not join the war, King did not hold us against a notional dominion. This was its right. But he thought that the British dominions uh, should stick together and defend each other. So that if Canada were attacked, Australia and New Zealand, as well as Britain, should go to its defense. If Australia was attacked, the others should uh, defend it as well. This did not mean that uh, the uh, dominions should go to the aid of countries, say, if South Africa wanted to uh, conduct a war in Africa. This is another matter. This is up to them to depend. But if they were in danger, they should stick together. They were a common uh, unity. So this was his view then of the uh, Commonwealth. And this is why he took Canada to war in 1939. Britain was threatened. He didn't go to war for Poland. He went to war because Britain was threatened. So they had their ups and downs. Then. The second uh, issue, which I've been talking about today, however superficially, was appeasement. King believed that the problems of the world could be solved by peaceful means. His complicated book, uh, sort of Industry Him and Humanity, written in 1918, is notionally about industrial relations, but it's also about international relations. Countries can get along, just as industry and workers can get along. He strongly believed in it. He was naive, he was hopeful, but he was not alone. And he saw Churchill as someone who was going to destroy this by his bellicosity. In 1939, on the eve of the war, uh, when it seemed though that an agreement would be possible with the Soviet Union, during the royal tour of North America at uh, Franklin Roosevelt's house uh, at Hyde Park in New York, uh, he described Winston Churchill as the greatest uh, danger to the British Empire. And the King, George VI, and Franklin Roosevelt did not disagree. Indeed, the king said he would do everything in his power to keep Churchill out of a government unless there were a war. He was considered too belligerent, upsetting the apple cart. The other side of that, though, was that the minute war began, he was the person they wanted in, inside uh, uh, the government. And Mackenzie King's attitude changed similarly. After a war began, and Churchill was in charge of the admiralty, in the winter of 1939-1940, the only service that was really fighting, there was no land fighting, no air fighting, but there was fighting at sea. Churchill became, or King became a great admirer of Churchill for the bold way he was conducting the war and for the morale raising speeches that he was giving. These were tremendous uh, speeches. When Churchill became prime minister in uh, May 10th, 1940, King, and Roosevelt, too, 
were afraid that perhaps Churchill would be undone because he was too impulsive and because he was too heavy a drinker. Within days, they got over this, but they had their reservations. And King thereafter became Churchill's strongest supporter. Uh, when there was an attempt, there were several attempts to push Churchill uh, out of his job in 1941, just before the German invasion of Russia, and put, uh, of all people, Robert Menzies, Mingis, the uh, Australian prime minister in. Mackenzie King saw immediately what was afoot and refused to act with it. He stood by Churchill. So he became a great admirer of Churchill. And at the end, when he was summing up, uh, and I have this in the book, of course, summing up and reflecting after the war about Roosevelt and Churchill. He said that Roosevelt was a very, very great man, but Churchill was even greater because of the range of his mind, his knowledge of history, his understanding of strategy and everything. But let me, make me, let me just make one more comment. And that was that even at the bottom, of their uh, disagreements in the 1930s. Uh, Mackenzie King still thought that Churchill had huge qualities, which he greatly admired. He just wished that they were being put to better use. So it, their, their relationship was up and down then, but it was always a friendly one, always a friendly one. And it ended up with King becoming a huge admirer of Churchill. And Churchill, a great, admirer and appreciator of King. It's an astonishing thing that at the second Quebec conference in 1944, when Mackenzie King said that he was worried about the uh, election, his election, which was coming up uh, the next year in 1945, Winston Churchill said, I'll come to Canada and give speeches for you. Imagine that, Winston Churchill coming to Canada to give campaign speeches for King. It never happened. King said, thanks anyway. You've done an enormous amount for you, for me. I mean, it's just bottles of mine, but it indicates how much Churchill appreciated what King was doing for the war. As it turned out, of course, it might have been better if he had gone to Britain uh, and given campaign speeches for Churchill, who was massively defeated in 1945. All right. Um, thank you, uh, Neville. We have uh two questions similar, so I'm going to combine them from Dan and from David. Uh, and that it's about, um, since you wrote your book in 1971 about appeasement, what, what, uh, how have the sources uh, changed or what new sources have come out since 1971 that would change how you view, uh, would view maybe what you wrote then or what have you learned since then? Well, I've learned a huge amount, but I think I still write the book in the same sort of framework. There will be more evidence, of course, because there's more available. Um, I think I still write it in much the same sort of way. I still think the way in which I try to explain the appeal of appeasement uh, as being fear of war, fear of communism, fear that uh, British uh, society and place in the world will be lost I think, still think that's uh, valid. But there, there I, I mentioned in this talk uh, this evening uh, a couple of things. One was that I didn't know, nobody knew in 1971, that wasn't British and French incompetence that had led to the collapse of the talks with the Soviet Union, and therefore uh, practically the guarantee of war by Hitler. It was because they simply couldn't pay the price that Russia wanted. They could not hand over to Stalin countries that they were denying Hitler. I mean, if they were taking a strong stand, if they were opposed to appeasement, they simply couldn't do it. They couldn't do it. I didn't know that. Nobody knew it until the Russian documents were available. I think they're closed again now, but they were available in the 1930s. The other thing that I didn't know, perhaps some people did know, was just how militarily strong Czechoslovakia was in 1938. Churchill, in fact, was right, whether he knew or he was just saying it, that, that, that they, they would have been better to fight for Czechoslovakia than Poland, rather than giving away, not just a country which was strategically located in the center of Europe, but which had massive armaments and had massive armament factories. I don't 
think, well, I know, I did not understand that at the time. Uh, there has been one book in particular, wonderful book uh, about this, but there have been many others as well. So the perspective has uh, changed definitely uh, from 1971. So I, I would have to write it differently. Uh, uh, but I, I don't think the basic structure would would alter that much. Okay, um, we have a question uh, from uh, Peter, and he's wondering. You, you mentioned um, Edward VIII and the how that was the turning point for um, Churchill's fortunes too, uh, the abdication crisis. Um, but what can you comment about Edward VIII and his relationship with the, the Nazis, and uh, what was um, what impact might that have had on um, the situation and public opinion in Britain? I, I'm not sure I followed all of that. Do, 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 so, are you asking Ed, me what? Ed, Edward are you asking VIII, me what Churchill's attitude towards the Nazis was? No. What what role might Edward VIII uh, and his connection with the Nazis play? Oh, okay, right. Yes. I mean that that's another thing that was unknown in 1971, uh, completely unknown. I mean it was well known, let's say in 1971, uh, that Edward VIII was sympathetic uh, to uh, Germany. Uh, after all, I mean, he, uh, he, he and uh, his wife, uh, Wallace Simpson, had their honeymoon in Germany. Uh, they were uh, greeted by uh, Hitler, uh, hailed, and so on. What was not known uh, was that it was more than sympathy, that Edward VIII was hoping that he would be put back on the British throne uh, if the uh, Germans succeeded in invading uh, Britain. He was, in fact, a traitor. I don't know if Churchill uh, knew the dimensions of this at all, but it's certainly true that even though Churchill strongly supported Edward VIII's uh, right to marry Wallace Simpson, or at least he said, let's wait, let's just all calm down and see what happens, talk this out for a while. He didn't actually support the marriage uh, uh, publicly. Uh, within a very short time, he recognized that they had a better monarch in George V. And he was well aware of uh, Edward's, uh, the, the Prince of, uh, the Duke of Windsor afterwards, sympathy with Nazi uh, Germany. And this is one of the reasons why in the Second World War, when uh, the Duke of Windsor wanted uh, to have a, an important military commander or something, Churchill made him the governor of the Bahamas, about as far away as he could get him from uh, Europe, out of harm's way. He wasn't going to jail him or anything as a traitor. He was going to get him out of the way. Uh, the, the Prince of uh, the Duke of Windsor never ceased pestering Churchill all through the war for a better job. Uh, uh, the one he really wanted was a job in Washington, but Churchill would not give him a job in diplomacy in Washington. And Roosevelt who also was well aware of Edward VIII's sympathies, though he probably didn't know how far they'd gone, said he would not accept Edward VIII, or now uh, the Duke of Windsor, uh, as a diplomatic representative in uh, Washington. So even though uh, the Duke of Windsor went to the United States, often was present in the gallery uh, with uh, Mackenzie King at Winston Churchill's speech to Congress in 1943, Churchill would not Give him a different job. Keep him out of the way in the Bahamas. And so, so Churchill recognized that he'd been wrong, even though he never actually said it, but he knew that he'd been wrong. All right, thank you. It's almost 8.20, so we're, we're going to take two more questions. I have a question from um, Eric. First of all, you mentioned that uh, the Conservatives and the Liberals in Canada were not very far apart in the 30s in terms of the views of um, Germany. Eric is asking, what are we to make of Mackenzie King's meeting with Hitler and his rather odd assessment of the dictator's place in European relations? You're speaking now about uh, uh, Mackenzie King going to visit Hitler in 1937 yeah. after the uh, coronation. This is at the invitation of uh, the German ambassador to London, uh, von Rippentrop, who was a lover, by the way, of uh, Wallace uh, Simpson, the future uh, wife of the uh, uh, Duke of Windsor. Uh, this is the invitation. He had been a champagne salesman in, uh, in uh, Canada 
near Canada, and he flattered King into making, into going to see uh, Hitler. This is just about the same time that Lloyd George, the British liberal leader, the man who had the reputation of being the man who won the war with a knockout blow uh, in the First World War, also went to Hitler. And they were both impressed. Hitler, it must be said, and in this sense, he was like Stalin, had a kind of magnetic charm on people. He could really convince people uh, that he was sincere. Just as Stalin was able in many cases, perhaps awkward to say this at the Churchill Society, in many ways, Stalin persuaded Churchill that he was sincere. Hitler had a, a way of persuading people that he was sincere. King was convinced uh, that Hitler did not want war, that he was a man of power. He might have his grievances. He might want to incorporate some Germans which were outside Germany in it. But this did not mean that he wanted to dominate the continent. But he also made a point. Some people have expressed skepticism of this, but I think it's true. He told Hitler that if there was a war against Britain, Canada would go to the defense of Britain. He told the British the same thing in 1937. He desperately hoped it wasn't going to happen, but if it did happen, Canada, he promised, and he had enough command of parliament to be able to do it, would go to war. And he lived up to this promise in 1939. No hesitation, no equivocation, Canada was going to war. It's true, it delayed a week so the parliament could give its uh, uh, imprimatur to it. Canada would not go to war automatically, but it was clear that Canada was already at war, was already aiding Britain, doing everything it could. Uh, Mackenzie King recognized uh, the responsibility for his actions in supporting Chamberlain. If it didn't turn out well, he would have to bear the consequences as well as Churchill as well as Chamberlain. He was not going to stand aside and say, it's your problem. He was going to stand there. And it's greatly to his credit that he did that. Uh, so, but he was taken in by Hitler. There is no doubt. Many other people were, as I say, Lloyd George, the list goes on and on. Um, so it, it's an astonishing thing. And it's also just to go move back a year. How many people were impressed by the German uh, by the Olympics in Germany in 1936. Here is a new, modern, dynamic country, uh, which has practically banished the depression uh, and so on, which people are well fed, organized and so on. It's amazing uh, the admiration that people have for it. Amazing in retrospect, because we know that Hitler was determined on war. Not, <laughs> this is, I'm sure I'm right on uh, this one. There's some dispute, but I'm sure I'm right on this one. Uh, because they believed Hitler's promises it was not war. He was just trying to build a strong society of all the Germans in Europe. That was all he wanted. So King was taken in, but many other people were too. The interesting question is, what if Churchill had met Hitler in 1932, when uh, Churchill was uh, touring the battlefields of his ancestor, the Duke of Marlborough, uh, Hitler had not yet come to power, but an intermediary uh, wanted to arrange a meeting between them. But Hitler backed out at the last minute. What would the, would the result of that be? Nobody can tell. Would Churchill have been impressed by Hitler? Would this have influenced his views later on on Germany's aims? Nobody knows. I mean, my guess, and it's only it can only be a guess, is that he would have been impressed by Hitler in some ways, as he was in his essay in 1934. He said, look, this is a dynamic leader who's doing great things for his country. But he would also, I think, still have been at very least skeptical about Hitler's ultimate intents. Hitler, or, or, sorry, Churchill's great insight was that this was not just about uniting Germans. It was about dominating Europe, including Britain. Thank you. Um, this is gonna to have to be our last question because it's almost 8.25 now. 
um, and this is from Harrison, and I'm going to summarize this, um, following up on what you just said about Mackenzie King. Should he be better known? I think you mentioned that he's not very well known outside Canada, and he's not very well known in Canada either. Um, should he be better known and, and his reputation in, in, um, in retrospect? Should Mackenzie King be better known? Should, should his reputation? Is that the should, should his reputation? Yeah. yeah. yeah comment on his reputation. Yes. And, uh, yes. Yes. Mackenzie King has been largely denigrated, if I may say so, by many Canadian historians. The idea is that Canada put up a great fight, tremendous effort, huge effort in relation to po population in the Second World War. But this was largely in spite of Mackenzie King. Mackenzie King was just the figurehead just going along with it. It was other people who were doing this. This is simply not true. Mackenzie King was wholeheartedly supporting the war, doing everything he could to mobilize uh, Canada, especially after uh, the German attack on France in May uh, 1940. When Franklin Roosevelt announced, after, a month after Pearl Harbor, announced to Congress the production targets that he wanted the United States uh, to meet by the end of 1942, people were gasping. These were huge production uh, targets, but they were almost exactly what Canada in relation to population was already producing which tells you what a contribution it was. Uh, Canada gave huge gifts, not Lend-Lease, which was supposedly to be paid back. In fact, it didn't work out that way, but in principle, it was paid back. Canada gave huge gifts, $4 billion uh, of uh, credits uh, to Britain during the war. Churchill was astonished that they could manage this. Another way of putting it is that Canada sold to Britain uh, the armaments, the food, raw materials and so on at about half price, which is a tremendous uh, contribution and asked for nothing in return, nothing in return. This was Mackenzie King's decision uh, and he could deliver because he controlled parliament in a way that Roosevelt could only admire. Roosevelt had to uh, deal with a Congress, which in very ways independent minded, even if the members were Democrats, uh, Mackenzie King controlled the Canadian Parliament and could uh, do these things. Both of them admired what uh, what uh, Mackenzie King produced and the way in which he did it. There's another thing I just add here, and that is the, that's something else that's not very well known, is that Canada made a tremendous contribution to American rearmament until about 1943, when the United States was fully armed, uh, supplying uh, the U.S. Uh, both before and especially after Pearl Harbor with armaments, which he was already equipped to, to do. And so it was supporting the United States as well as uh, Britain. The contribution is enormous. There are books on this, but they're mostly written within a Canadian context for a Canadian audience without too much reference uh, to the other countries, which means in effect, Britain and the United States, because those are the two countries with which Canada was concerned. There is one historian, formerly British, now American, Nigel Hamilton, who made his reputation by writing a big biography of uh, uh, Field Marshal Montgomery, uh, has now written many other things. He's written three volumes recently, in recent years, on uh, Roosevelt as commander in chief. And he has drawn extensively on King's diaries. Uh, he said, you know, this, this information is wonderful. Here we have evidence of what Roosevelt is thinking and doing, his relationships with Churchill and uh, so on. And I would like to see more of that. And perhaps the third man will help to do this. It's already got some attention in the United States and Britain. And I hope it will get more, partly for my own benefit, but partly also because it's an important part of the world story, especially the story of the Western alliance, which, the, which needs to be told. Canada has been too modest about its part. Well, thank you, uh, Neville. And uh, this is the book that I hope will um, make Kings and Canada's role uh, better known in Canada and uh, in the United States and in Britain as well. And I'd like to uh, call upon the chair of uh, the Churchill Society, 
uh, Cameron Mackay to uh, offer our thanks to um, our speaker. Well, and good evening and thank you, uh, uh, Professor Thompson. Um, you know, our society was created uh, as many were across the world to uh, honor and remember the work of Winston Churchill. There was a fear that it would be forgotten. Now there are over 1100 biographies written about him and it's an absurd, you know, he's probably the most famous person or among the most famous person on, on earth. You know, the thing that I thought about through this whole discussion about uh, uh, this evening was around the word appeasement and how sort of terminally infected it, it, it's become. And I've been cataloging in my head, what are the other words that are sort of dead on arrival, you know? Uh, and that is certainly one of them. But, you know, I looked at the comments of participants tonight and they were trying to draw and they were drawing comparisons to Trump and China and Russia, et cetera, it's very much with us. So the idea, I was first of all dismissing the idea of appeasement as a concept or a stratagem. It seems ridiculous today. Of course we do it today. It's a part of diplomacy. And we have to live with these ambiguities. So I appreciate you bringing this context. I appreciate you uh, bringing it to life. And I, I appreciate Southern and House and, and uh, the coupon code, which I just ordered the book, by the way. Um, and I encourage everyone to do, and you'll you'll save some money. And I would like to thank as well, of course, Alan Williams for bringing this together, and Molly Haw and David Piper, and of course the York Minister York Minister uh, Speaker Series for allowing us to partner with this. It's been a fascinating discussion, and I hope our paths, um, Professor Thompson, will continue to cross because we've enjoyed this immensely. Thank you very much, in turn, and good luck uh, to the Churchill Society in its noble work and to the York Minster series in uh, inviting so many interesting speakers. I wish both of you all the very best and thank you sincerely for this opportunity and invitation. Good night to everyone.